Welcome to the Western Museum of Flight. I'm Cindy Maka, the director. Who better than an experienced test pilot himself to train a robot how to fly an experimental airplane? The QF-86 is, of course, a venerable fighter plane converted for use as an aerial target. And Roy Martin is going to describe for us how these aircraft operate and how we use them. Hey, welcome to the Western Museum of Flight. My name's Roy Martin. I'm one of the docents here at the museum. Today I'd like to feature our beautiful uh, F-86 aircraft that we have on display at the museum. The F-86 uh, has the distinction of being America's first jet-powered, swept-wing aircraft that was designed here in the United States. About 7,800 of these airplanes were built by North American Aviation here in Southern California. And uh, like I said, this was America's first swept-wing airplane. So why the swept-wing? Well, in 1944, the uh, U.S. Army Air Force at that time had a requirement for a jet fighter air superiority aircraft that would go 600 miles per hour. So with that requirement, then the North American Aviation Design Team sat down and designed the F-86, but the initial design actually had a straight wing on it and not a swept wing. But the problem was the straight wing, as you got close to uh, the high speeds, close to supersonic flight, would develop a shock wave on the top uh, of, the, of the wing of the airplane, and there wasn't sufficient power to push through uh, to go to the higher speeds, and that was limiting the uh, high speed of the aircraft. So to get to the 600 miles per hour minimum requirement, the North American team borrowed from the Germans a concept of sweeping the wing back. This allowed the airplane to go at a higher speed before the onset of this shock wave. Once they did this, they found that the airplane could go out to and was demonstrated to 671 miles per hour. So that met the requirement uh, uh, for, the, uh, for, for the Army Air Force at that time. Um, the airplane first flew in the uh, 1st of October of 1947, which was about 14 days prior to Chuck Yeager going uh, supersonic in the Bell X-1. Uh, both of these flights were occurred out at Edwards. Uh, test pilot George Welch, North American aviation test pilot was the, uh, was the pilot on the first flight. And in fact, uh, Mr. Welch indicated that in a dive, the airplane could go supersonic safely, and it could. Uh, this later was demonstrated by the very first female test pilot to go supersonic. Actually, the first female pilot to go supersonic was Jackie Cochran. And in 1953, she took an F-86 into a dive, into supersonic flight, and interestingly, her chase pilot that day and the pilot on her wing was Chuck Yeager. <laughs> now, the airplane is most renowned, of course, for its uh, prowess in uh, maintaining air superiority in the Korean Peninsula during the Korean War. Uh, the F-86 enjoyed an excellent kill ratio against the MiG-15 airplanes, what were also swept-wing uh, jet fighter aircraft that were being flown by the Chinese and the North Korean pilots. And in fact, 41 pilots of F-86 could claim to be aces after the Korean War for flying the airplane. That's how good it was as far as its, its ability against uh, uh, the MiG-15 aircraft. Uh, as we got into the mid-1950s after the Korean War, uh, the Century Series fighter of aircraft like the F-100 were coming off the drawing board. They had higher performance. So the F-86 was then passed on to the Air National Guard. And the Air National Guard pilots then flew it all the way up through the early 1970s. And it was kind of a, a, a prime assignment for an Air National Guard pilot to be assigned to a unit that had, had F-86s because it was such a fun airplane to fly. Um, the 7,800 of these aircraft that I said were built here by North American in Southern California, but there was another 2,000 airplanes that were licensed to be built by overseas uh, countries. And in fact, uh, 200 airplanes were built by Mitsubishi Corporation of the, uh, of, of, of the J Japanese Air Defense Force uh, to support the Japanese Air Defense Force. And uh, these airplanes were built under a license to North American. The reason I bring up the Japanese airplane is because in the 1970s, after Japan had uh, moved on to uh, higher performance aircraft, they were phasing out their F-86s, and interestingly, they were purchased by the U.S. Navy. So why would the U.S. Navy want to buy some old uh, 
uh, fighter type design, uh, air, some old uh, fighter aircraft. Now the answer came in that the Navy had a requirement to test air-to-air -air missiles against a, uh, a realistic aircraft type of target. So what they chose to do, and I'll use my model here, they took uh, one of the F-86s that they brought back from Japan, they reassembled it, and they installed a drone system so that the airplane could be actually flown with no pilot on board. It could take off, fly, and land with no pilot. To do that, in this area right in here, they had an access panel to a control system that was a computer. They had different antennas that would receive a signal from a ground station with a ground control pilot flying the airplane. And he would fly it by reference to an instrument panel that he had on the ground that looked like the F-86. Plus, he had a TV camera to look, a uh, TV uh, display to look at. The camera for that TV display was right up here in the forward area, which used to be the gun site on the F-86, was now replaced by a small TV camera, and that gave the out the forward view for the ground control pilot to fly the airplane. Uh, in addition, the ground control pilot had a plot board beside his ground control station, and the various radars on the China Lake range would then report the position that the aircraft was at, and the pilot could then reference that when he was flying the airplane on the China Lake range. That then allowed for a takeoff of an unmanned aircraft, go up on the range, and they could actually shoot air-to-air -air missiles at it uh, as a realistic sized target. Now, after the concept had been demonstrated by the engineers at China Lake, Northrop Aircraft was then given a contract to come and to reassemble approximately 100 of these aircraft. The parts and pieces had been brought back from Japan. The aircraft were reassembled at a hangar in Inyakern Airport, which is right next to the China Lake uh, Range facility. Uh, the Northrop would reassemble the airplane, install the drone system, and then it would be ready to be checked out. That's where I and the other test pilots at Northrop had an opportunity to be invited to come up and fly the airplane and check out the aircraft prior to delivery to the Navy. So we would take turns. There was five of us pilots involved in this program. Daryl Cornell, our boss, and then Paul Metz, Jim Sandberg, Chuck Johnson, and myself. As the pilots then would take turns getting to go up to Inukern to fly the, what was then called the QF-86. Our first flight in the airplane would be a functional check flight to take it and fly the, the airplane and check out the basic systems of the airplane. Uh, the first thing you found flying the airplane is that the flying qualities were excellent. It had very responsive and just felt like a really good airplane and it had really good turn performance. So it was obvious why it enjoyed uh, its success in the Korean, Korean War. However, the J-47 engine suffered a little bit by today's standards for engines. For example, it took, if you move the throttle, from idle up to mill power, it would take 15 seconds for the engine to wind up and stabilize at mill power. And of course, by today's standards, it's almost an instantaneous response to the engines. So you learn to compensate for the slow engine response. While we were doing these uh, checkouts of the airplane uh, for the functional basic systems, we had a couple of incidents. In the case for Jim Sandberg one day, uh, the main landing gear would not come down and lock. And so, try as he might, they couldn't get it to move past a, a mid position. But they did manage to get the landing gear up, the nose gear down, and once they were in that configuration, Jim then came back and landed the airplane on the wing tanks at a foamed runway in China Lake. And it ended up being minimum damage to the F-86 and fortunately no damage to Jim. So that was one of the incidents. We had some other incidents in which we would have a brake failure upon landing at uh, Inyakern, which would send us off into the dirt at the far end of the runway or the side of the runway, at which case the lucky, new, the lucky uh, part of Inyakern was that the desert was the same height of the runway, so you would just go out in the desert and come to a stop and generally no damage to the airplane. After we completed the functional check flights of the airplane and, and saw that the basic systems were good, we would then taxi to a high point on the Inyakern airport and we could actually hook up to the drone, the drone control pilot who was then flying the airplane from the China Lake uh, facility. Uh, to do this, we had a little lever on the front of the stick. We would engage that lever and hold it 
And while we held that lever, the uh, ground control pilot could then hook up through the various systems and can operate the flight controls, the throttle, the brakes, uh, and the flaps on the airplane from the remote control pilot. Once he was happy that he had good control of everything, we would disengage and that would immediately revert the airplane back to the onboard pilot. We would then take off and about 500 feet in the air, we would then re-engage the lever and allow the ground control, remote control operator pilot to uh, take over and fly the airplane. Kind of a shout out to uh, Dick Wright and Harlan Reese who are a couple of these uh, uh, pilots that flew most of this stuff from the ground control station. They would then fly the airplane through the various maneuvers that were going to be required to use it as a target for air-to-air -air missiles. Once they were happy that the system was operating as they expected, they would bring us back on final approach and then we would take over and actually let go of the lever and land the airplane ourselves. Paul Metz did fly one approach one day where he kept the lever engaged and allowed the remote pilot to actually land the airplane with him on board. But he said that it was so rough and he was, he was uh, really fearful that we might get into an attitude in which we wouldn't have time to recover. So he recommended to the rest of us that we not do that anymore, and so we didn't. We would always disengage and then land the airplane uh, by ourselves. When everything worked out, we then got a chance to fly the airplane over to China Lake, deliver it to the Navy. The Navy then, would fly the airplane with no pilot on board. They would put it on the runway, start the engine, close the canopy, engage the drone system, and now the remote control pilot would take off, fly the airplane up to altitude, put it through its maneuvers, and let other airplanes shoot missiles at it. If these missiles had no warhead, then more often than not, the missile would come close and maybe not hit the airplane or only hit a small piece of the airplane, at which case the QF-86 could be recovered for landing and used another day. However, for those cases where there was a warhead in the air-to-air -air missile, more often than not, when they fired the missile and it properly tracked, it would blow up when it hit the airplane and would cause the QF-86 to be destroyed. These were kind of bittersweet tests because you were happy that the missile had functioned properly, but it was always kind of sad to see a beautiful airplane like the F-86 to be shot down and destroyed. Anyway, one of these has survived, F-86F. This airplane was actually built in Japan, and then was disassembled, brought back to the United States, reassembled, and we're very lucky to have it on display here at the Western Museum of Flight. Please come by, we'll show you the airplane, and we'll share other stories with you. Thank you.